Wendy Chamberlain, MP, thank you ever so much uh, for coming on the show to talk Afghanistan and the tragedy that that country has become. Well, thank you very much for having me, Ro. It's a, a pleasure to be here today. Um, you're also the, 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 a member of the APPG for Women and Girls um, in, uh, in British Parliament. Um, for our listeners outside the UK who do not know what that means, if you could just give us the details of yeah, what you ab do, absolutely, absolutely. why you do it. So, so I am co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group for Afghan women and girls. And an all-party parliamentary group is exactly what it says in the tin. It brings together uh, representatives of all political parties within parliament to talk about, discuss um, uh, and develop uh, work in relation to a particular uh, subject interest. Uh, the APPG was created about 18 months ago. Um, it's co-chaired by myself, Caroline Noakes from the Conservative Party and Liz Savile Roberts from Plaid Cymru. And we very much view ourselves as time bound in that mm. um, we want to see our position as where we um, obviously raise issues directly affecting Afghan women and girls. Most notably, we had um, a, a backbench business debate uh, on that um, several months ago. But as well as that, we actually want to amplify Afghan women and girls' voices so that we're not necessary, so that the right connections are being made between FCDO, between uh, you know other government departments, so that those voices are heard directly rather than through ourselves as interlocutors. So, so that's I, I see myself as as stepping back from mm. um, that role um, in in due course, but by the same token, absolutely not uh, not continuing to, to to advocate, particularly when. We are just obviously in such a fragile world at the moment and so many awful things are happening yeah. and, and Afghanistan feels like it has gone down the, the, the priority list simply because more, more you know, more direct uh, and immediate situations have presented themselves. But I think that makes it even more important um, that uh, we don't forget, particularly when we hear about what is happening in Afghanistan and how the situation for women and girls in particular is 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 just awful. And, you know, uh, the last time I checked, I think the, the Taliban, you know, that have been on a full on assault on women from the day they, they you know, captured Kabul. And uh, as, as, as a British politician who's, of, ho of course, had an, an eye on what's going on in Afghanistan, how are those, you know, how, how, how do you kind of, just going back to August 2021, and, you know, how did you feel as, you know, as, as a politician in the UK looking in, into a country where Britain invested so much blood and treasure and, you know, uh, many brave men and women didn't come home. And of course, thousands and thousands of people in Afghanistan died and soldiers, police, women, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so how did that, you know, how would you characterize, you know, people have said defeat, betrayal. Um, so how would you characterize the way Afghanistan was vacated or yeah. abandoned? So, so um, it's first of all probably just useful to just give a little bit of context about my experience as a politician mm. in that um, I was um, not political um, earlier in my adult life. I was a police officer for 12 years in mm. uh, Scotland, which is actually quite difficult to be political because of um, you know, we, we, uh, the, the type of work that policing is. And in fact, the representation of the People Act sort of precludes yeah. police officers from being directly engaged in politics. But I joined the Liberal Democrats in 2015 and then was elected in December 2019. And obviously then the sort of key focus in those uh, early stages of my time in Parliament was COVID. And actually going back to thinking about the APPG, that opportunity to bring people or get to know people in different parties was actually really, really important impacted negatively by COVID. You know, those conversations that you might be having in person or those relationships, you were, you were sitting, you were sitting on Zoom. In fact, I, you know, I remember saying that, you know, I wasn't necessarily friends with anybody in my own party um, <laughs> after a good period of time because I hadn't had the opportunity to develop those relationships. Putting my Labour Party hat on, you're in the wrong party. <laughs> so when we were in, when we were in, you know, when when the fall of Afghanistan happened, I mean, you know, I'm in 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 my mid to late forties now, and you know, so 
Afghanistan 20 years ago was was something mm. that you know I was a uh, you know very conscious of as as a younger person and part of that narrative around sort of the globe who who were the, the global uh, defenders or, or or police as as it were um and it did feel like um and particularly given my politics and I, and I assume, I'm assuming yours as well Ro, that you know all this talk about global Britain um mm. from from a government and that soft power element that uh, the UK is perceived to have or, or certainly was to see that removal and knowing what that removal of um you know uh, American and, and British troops and others were, was going to bring um it was exactly uh, as predicted in fact I think it happened that uh, collapse and the Taliban returning came about much much more uh, quickly than than people had predicted and um you know as a, a sort of backbench uh, politician, um, you could just you you just watched what was happening uh, in horror. Mm. Um, I was fortunate that I didn't have um any constituents who were directly impacted, but you know I had my colleague Manira uh, Wilson in Twickenham. Mm. She was fighting for the best part of two years to have um you know children who were UK citizens, but their mother uh, was not. To get them uh, over to the, the the UK, and um, you know the volume that I know that some MPs experienced and their caseworkers was just completely overwhelming, and mm. there was very little that you could do to support. And I remember early this year I visited uh, Glasgow Afghans United and spoke to to, to women there, and um, on the back of that received emails where. And my husband is a is a mad Heart of Midlothian supporter football club. You know, he says on his WhatsApp, uh, club kids, wife in that order of priority. Okay. And, you know, I, got sent, <laughs> I got sent an email where, you know, it was a woman who was messaging for help. Um, obviously had no links to, to Northeast Fife at all, but shared pictures of her husband um, in photographs with Scottish soldiers mm. with a Heart of Midlothian um, football club and um, Flag, you know flag and yeah. so that just you know really directly you see the relationships that were clearly built up when UK forces uh, were there and you know I absolutely understand why why those left particularly those who worked with the, the, the previous uh, uh, government um feel feel but it was quite not, and... not, not just shambolic but it was quite disgraceful the way you know it was a failure of politics I believe then you know, military or and and po our political leaders failed spectacularly during yes. that debacle. I think and you I... make assumptions that there are systems in place, and when awful things happen, that system will swing into action. And to see that, that frankly, the opposite of that um, was 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 very difficult to, to to watch. And I had Sir Laurie Bristow in in one of the previous episodes. Uh, and it's, it's 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 an incredibly insightful one. I I I implore our listeners to go and listen to it. And he said Britain had been planning for different scenarios for months in advance. Uh, but you know how did that come to end up in the way it did? But what what is you know for me what is hard to stomach and how easily it's been forgotten? You know all has been forgotten. Um, and people who were in charge were have been never held to account for the way they abdicate responsibility. And those days were incredibly painful for, for so I, many I, people. I think it feels like there's a real short termism in uh, thinking. Now, some of that is driven by the nature of our politics and democracy and, and, um, uh, and uh, you know, elections every five years. And, you know, uh, before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about electoral reform. For me, the mm. fact that we work in a parliamentary system where first past the post means that, you know, there's a majority party that wins and, you know, we, we end up um, sort of arguing and, and fighting rather than sort of accepting that coalitions, which I think for me are, are more stable ways of working uh, in the longer term and help you focus on that strategic goal. I think that is that is one of the issues that we face. So that short termism and, dare I say it, you know the complete overtaking of this of the system by both COVID, but also Brexit and preparing for Brexit means mm. that you know it might have been on somebody's uh, desk in terms of thinking about those different scenarios. 
but we didn't properly pre prepare from a strategic perspective in terms of if a scenario played out, what would that mean and, and what would the capabilities be required um, to, 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 you know, to provide, to provide the support or even just manage the expectations of what might be done. Yeah, and, and as the, the co-chair of the, um, the APP, APPG for Women and Girls, um, how difficult is it to to keep Afghanistan relevant? I mean, you know, you, you just you mentioned that Afghanistan has been pushed all the way back yes. to, you know, the bottom of priorities when it comes to, you know, yeah. uh, foreign policy as well as, you know, humanitarian issue. Um, so how, how difficult it is to get to get politicians interested yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things I would also say is, is in terms of my political journey, I'm not a foreign policy e e expert, and I've obviously been in a huge learning journey myself in relation mm. to Afghanistan. And and I think one of the most important things to remember about Afghanistan is there's lots of different uh, cultures, communities yeah. within it, and they are not all necessarily aligned. So you have to ensure that you are trying to to represent mm. all those voices as much as possible. But really, it's about taking every opportunity uh, that that you can, both from a domestic situation. So you mentioned that you've had Johnny Mercer on recently, and um, obviously that what was happening or has happened to uh, those Afghans who were successful in coming to the UK and home rehousing them and and providing them with support again has been a policy area where the government. Um, have 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 for me um, failed if we've got still got people in in hotels after two years or or indeed now presenting as homeless to our local authorities that suggests a, a policy failure to me but also from that international perspective so you just try and take any opportunity that you can so mm. for example when Andrew Mitchell um, uh, had a statement a couple of weeks ago in relation to the new international development government strategy uh, white paper. Um, you know, I took the opportunity there to talk about uh, Afghan Afghan women and girls. So it's just keeping that in the conscience. And I think it's also important for government to know that, well, actually, Wendy Chamberlain or mm -hmm. Liz Savile Roberts will always raise Afghan women and girls. We need to be therefore think, thinking about that in te terms of our responses. And, you know, I will say for Andrew Mitchell, clearly on the International Development White Paper, the uh, cross-party consultation on that, all parties acknowledged it, was, was was very good. Now, there's plenty more that I would have wanted to see within it, but, um, you know, I think we are in a better place than potentially we were. And there's absolutely no doubt, you know, I suppose one of my first steps into sort of th this area was mm. when I was International Development Spokes for the Liberal Democrats when I was first elected. And, you know, for me, the, the loss of, of DFID is still is is still very difficult and i think from a humanitarian aid perspective i think the loss of diffid is another one of those sort of nails in the coffin of of, of global of global britain and why you know uh, re-engagement with global south and, and and other places is is, is so important um, as as we look to an election next year and the the, the taliban's full-on assault on women have been characterized as gender apartheid Mm -hmm. um, and, I, know, and I think I have called I have called it that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, one of your fellow, one of your fellow great Scott, as you know, again wearing my party political hat, Gordon Brown, mm -hmm. in one of his interventions recently said that you know the ICC should intervene. Um, there's a there's a strong case for uh, Taliban leaders who are involved in. In, in, in persecuting in, uh, women and girls should face, uh, you know, should be, should be should be persecuted themselves because of the crimes that they're committing against women and girls in Afghanistan. Well, there's the, there's always that re real irony, isn't it, of you know Taliban leaders whose um child daughters are are being educated uh, over overseas, isn't mm. there? There's it's that there is a sort of rank hypocrisy to a lot of what the Taliban is doing and then the real concern about the increase in in um you know madrasas where yeah you know i think there is a real genuine concern that uh, afghanistan will become a place that sort of um grows the next generation of of of, of terrorists because yeah because um and what, what know, is your line of thinking on on that on the, on that you know the, the repercussions of what the taliban are doing to women and what should happen in terms of a, a legal response to what they do. So I mean, would you push as as a grouping in parliament for A, 
you know, the parliament and British parliament recognizes what's going on in Afghanistan as, you know, gender apartheid. And also the ICC and other bodies who can pursue the group and hold the account, the, 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 the group responsible um, for their actions. I mean, is there some sort of push for something? I mean, would you call for that? Um, I think that's something we need we need to discuss as an APPG, and we're and we're coming we're, we're we're coming together soon. I think what has been really important in terms of the work we've done in the APPG is hearing from all the different stakeholders and, and voices, and ensuring that we're getting engagement for them through uh, the FCDO as well as you know a number of of, of the the aid organisations as well. And um, it does feel like a deteriorating situation. And I have no doubt that given the, you know, the destabilizing impact of, uh, you know, the, the conflict in, in the Middle East, that, uh, you know, the Taliban will be taking that opportunity, won't they, while others' uh, eyes are averted. So, you know, things that we've discussed, and, and I know, you know, Zena Zahidi, who has been mm. a huge advocate and supporter, she's not directly involved with APPG, but uh, has certainly been somebody that's that's been part of my education, yeah. you know, thinking about, how do we use other inter international international uh, partners? Looking at sort of what does sort of a, a global summit uh, look like, and and also just looking at you know what are the, the the sort of wider terms of reference that we would want we would want the government the government to pursue. So um, there's clearly a lot more work to be to be done. Um, and I think, we, 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 you know, there's no doubt that the election next year, one of the challenges, obviously, is for an all-party parliamentary group is... is yeah, you know, to be reformed. Along and, and, you, and you're reforming and, and potentially reforming with different MPs, with them, um, with, 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 with different priorities and interests. And, and, you know, I think we would both say that we're probably looking at a change of government as well. So a Hopefully. change of approach is, 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 um, is, is quite strong. Um, and, you know, I know Preet Gill in, in Labour, yeah. when she was previous international development uh, uh, shadow secretary, had, had had done a lot of work in this space and, and brought David Lammy along with that. So you would like to think that you will see a, a, a renewed focus as a result of that. And I mean, is there a kind of a, a network of organisations and also do, do you have a, a sense of a, a, a sister organisations in, in, in other European and Western parliaments or... Um, you know, no, I, it's pretty I, much the, the, the yeah, your I mean, organization. We, have, we probably haven't had the opportunity to do that, and I think that's 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 a next a next step in terms of you know, for for our first focus was about hearing the voices and making some of the connections and getting FCDO engagement, and we've had a degree of success with that. I think those are kind of the next the next steps, and that's back to those kind of international uh, partners and uh, and approaches. Um, I think. Where we've been so fortunate, the other person I should mention is Neil Neil Reina, who acts mm. as our secretariat, um, with her connections, um, with with her knowledge, um, has has been incredibly powerful for for bringing the the, the right people together and re and really and really sort of drawing attention to the work that as parliamentarians that we've been doing. And um, I'm very clear that I kind of you know I stand on the shoulder of those giants in terms of the the amplification that I'm trying to do. You know, what, what is it that makes you worried about Afghanistan now? It's pretty much seen as a humanitarian issue. Yes. But in terms of, you know, you've got 28 million people going hungry, the geopolitics of the region and the Taliban. Do, do you do you see the Taliban as a terrorist organization? Well, I, I think they, they they have committed acts of uh, terrorism against the Afghan uh, the Afghan people, and and you know I think you've you've pointed out an, a number of issues because obviously from a humanitarian perspective, the limits they've put on on women working um, with the humanitarian agencies. What do you do there? Do you make a principled stand that you're therefore not going to engage, knowing that that means that twenty eight you know adds to the to the to the suffering of of 28 mil million people and it, it's interesting because um you, you know you'll, you'll be aware of Tobias Elwood and, and yes. the former uh, yeah. defense select committee and and the blowback that he got earlier this year and and you know I had a lot of you know the stakeholders from the Afghan women girls who were absolutely appalled uh, but 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 by his comments and some of his argument was well you know there got to come a point where, where you where you work but you you work with them but um I don't think we're anywhere near that point. And in fact, you know, the steps that they are continuing to take are, are just so, so awful. Uh, mm. And so against sort of those international uh, values that, uh, that you know, that, that there needs to be a degree of, of, of consequence for that. But 
how do you find the right balance between you know potentially creating such a prior state that uh, mm. that you do you know they, they are then you know um an, an international aggressor aggressor and danger to you know civilian populations in other countries and you know, it's all very grim and uh, just to end it in a more hopeful note what makes you you know you're in touch with a lot of women from afghanistan hopefully and i assume you know you get contacts from inside what makes you hopeful let's end it in a in a hopeful um so sense. a number of the younger women that are involved and ad advocating and then when i speak to you know some of the parliament previous parliament uh, tarians like uh, fazia kufi and just her determination and her inner steel and um you know she just um just has she just is quite direct and you know, doesn't stand on ceremony and, and very clear. So th there's that aspect. And I, I think there's just a bit for me around um, that uh, I'm trying to think how to, to, put, to put it into words and um, what is hopeful. But I think, you know, there is already things happening and ways around and you know, I was at an event that that um, I, I spoke at a few weeks ago, which was celebrating Afghan women, and there was such joy and humour, um, and 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 you know, hope in the room despite mm. that. And I think you know, hope will 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 always survive. And when I think about some of the things that happened, one of the the things that I highlighted in my debate was, uh, you know, the Asli. I, I think it's the Asli Papas. The names got out my head but mm. basically where that is around communities helping themselves as opposed to accepting aid how do you and um, potentially help with a local economy that provides that support you know th there are there are things happening um, and uh, and we should we should absolutely keep that hope on that note wendy chamberlain mp thank you ever so much for uh talking afghanistan with you and i'm really thank grateful you. it's been such a pleasure thank you thank you thanks Rob.